Thank you for having me. A little about me, uh, besides the blurb, um, I'm English and French in my family ancestry. You can hear from my voice that I was raised on other shores. I was raised on unceded Coast Salish territory in Western Canada and Vancouver Island. And I'm very um, privileged to call Te Whanganui Atara home, where Te Ateawa, Taranaki Whanui, and Ngāti Tōr are mana whenua. I teach in politics at the university here. Um, and I'm really glad to be with you because these, um, what you're I think about the commitments that bring us together, the concerns that bring us together in this work, in this group. Uh, and it's a pleasure to um, think about what we can ask together in, in that context. One of the things I have a hunch about is that we share, as I see it, there's uh, many, many reasons to be disenchanted with politics as usual. So certainly formal politics um, uh, of that prevail in the day. And usually that leads to disengagement, direct action, or direct, uh, democratic innovation. And I have a hunch that those who are, who are here tonight are really in, drawn to the last. Um, and also because of a shared understanding that um, democracy is so much more than its most recent mechanism, newly innovated. Uh, a representative democracy, and that that's not only just a recent tool to realize a more fundamental aim, democratic aims, but also often a really insufficient one. Um, and so uh, deliberation is often answering a lot of the issues in uh, that a more aggregate of politics present. Um, Whereas added up tools can be very clear and very much more straightforward to implement, they also presume that all our fixed, our preferences and our ideas about the world are fixed rather than improved when we come together and listen to each other. Um, and as much as their um, effectiveness also hinges, just like deliberation, on our ability to be informed, it's often not a prerequisite to go and vote or put in your voice on a referendum uh, or a petition. Um, and so these tools also, unlike deliberation, can lead to further polarization rather than finding compromise or mutual agreement or mutual understanding or even innovation, all the things we hold dear and desperately need. But there's something more fundamental to majority rule tools that I want to highlight today, tonight, particularly because they're much more readily at the reach of people in Aotearoa, as I find it, who are Democrats, and say, "Ah, oh, let's let's realize democracy through our through a vote mechanism, a referendum, a petition, et cetera, the majority rule mechanisms that we've got." Um, and so we kind of, I think it's worth on staying with those a little tonight in the context of being in the settler colonial society. And then I'll pivot to the end of thinking about deliberation in this context as well, democracy in these two guises. Um, so the, the real risk um, in any context, as we know, I think in this group, um, if you're involved in deliberative alternatives, uh, the real risk to added up mechanisms is majority rule can silence up to nearly half of a population. You know, they can actually be a tool of silencing, you know, up to 49% of a population um, because of that majority emphasis. And so that, of course, can lead to tyranny of the majority and the loss of really essential voices and perspectives that we say have equal value and equally need to be heard in collective decision making. Um, many constitutional and democratic scholars talk about this, that majority rule uh, offers, quote, no protection against arbitrary actions or against actions directed at benefiting a temporary majority at the expense of minorities, end quote. Um, and so taken together, majority rule tools are limited and blunt and cannot fulfill democracy's promise to enable um, all of us to have an equal voice in, in collective decision making. They can, in fact, obstruct that aim. Uh, they can suppress voices that we need to hear. They can limit um, the equality among us in that collective act of, uh, of uh, being part of the demos. Uh, the voice to parliament was a really great example of this recently. This was a process preceded by one of the most groundbreaking nationwide uh, deliberative processes, uh, the largest consensus ever among First Nations peoples across the country through careful consideration and deliberation dialogue. They landed on three key recommendations and one of those went to a vote, one of those went to a referendum. Um, and it illustrates the real risks of majority rural tools um, as um, in this case, despite that deep consideration and being deeply informed to come up with these recommendations, the one recommendation that went to the vote, voice to parliament, in itself, a core uh, realizing a democratic 
aim, which is ensuring the voices of those that get silenced or suppressed or excluded. In this case, a single, a single person to represent all Indigenous peoples in Australia. Not a decide, not even a, not one with veto power, not one with even decision making power, but just to be a voice at the table. That's what the recommendation was. And it was because of um, a really well organized, well funded, if you don't know, vote no campaign. I think I have a little on oh, the next slide. Um, and also because of some quite artificially contrived parameters or thresholds, you know, not only would it have to be a majority vote, but also a, a certain number of majority divided up by these arbitrary lines of, of the regions um, meeting both of those thresholds. Because of these, uh, this conspiring of factors, it meant we ended up with a real no, no, and largely because of a largely uninformed populace in this case. But even if the whole population had voted yes, as they did with same-sex marriage, say, and uh, similarly, a majority, all the whole population voting on the right of minority group, it should not be the domain of a majority to vote whether another group that is a minority has a right to a voice at the table, especially those with unseated authority um, in that land. Uh, and so we can see the real risks here already of majority vote instruments as, they're, um, as they roll out in settler colonial contexts, even in this case. So in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and this is the case for any settler colonial society, numbers, not even weapons, not even the spread of disease, yes, those play a role, but numbers is the number one tool of settler colonization. The sheer weight of demographics over time that tip the scales of whose uh, values, protocols, institutions, sense of common sense comes to predominate. Uh, settler Tur uh, Stephen Turner, who's a, 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 a famous New Zealand historian here, talks about settler dreaming, that through the logic of sheer numbers accruing over time, ships upon ships upon ships arriving, tipping the scales here, as you can see in the change in population over time, uh, making the dreams, the ideas about the world that settlers bring with them into the reality. If enough of us are here carrying this idea about what the world is, it becomes the reality of that place. So demographics is that I'd already identified in the settler colonial scholarship as the number one tool uh, of, of settler dominance um, in across all of these uh, countries, you know, Canada, Australia, uh, US um, and Aotearoa, New Zealand. So that's not the vision of Tetiriti, that's not the vision. And um, in fact, what I think of now in 1840, back in 1840, uh, Tangata Whenua were a super majority. They were somewhere between 98 and 99% of the population. Newcomers from Britain were a the equivalent of a really small hapu. Um, and in that state in 1840, a super majority looked on this newest group, newly arrived, Mm, their, their their ruler was way across the sea, never to be met. You know, some people had met her, uh, the crown at this point, but um, most had not, had never visited these shores. Some representatives of that group were acting up in Russell, you know, not really being the best face for Britain at the time. But nonetheless, they extended this incredibly generous granting of the right not only to share a home, which is an exceptional thing, but also to even empower that small group to self-govern. So that's kawanatanga, transliterated from governor, the word that was used to describe Pontius Pilate in the Bible by the same translators, the word to be used to describe the British governor in Sydney at the time that many rangatira had gone to visit over the preceding years to find out about British law. Um, but at the same time, that small group uh, committed to upholding the ongoing of political authority, the Tino Rangatiratanga, of those who had granted that right, who were already here with their governance structures, their institutions, their laws, the Mataranga. So it was about a vision of coexisting authorities as a vision of coming together, respecting one another's authority to govern in their own ways over their own people. Um, and uh, the vision that I have for it, um, that I, I have heard M Helmut Modlik talk about a lot is uh, the waka haurua, right? The double hulled canoe, this ability of this kind of balanced, balanced um, coexisting spheres of authority 
uh, as a vision for, as uh, Tatiliti talks about, uh, peaceful coexistence and mutual benefit, like a really beautiful vision, especially when you think about the imbalance of minority majority at the time. Um, and this was the vision that we were given. So we haven't done very well in realizing this vision, and we'll talk about that for the rest of tonight. Um, I hope we can get to the other things I want to talk about. I have so many things I want to share with you, but let's set the scene a little. So this was from Hei Pua Pua, the vision of where we are now in terms of the um, overextension of Kawanatanga, not in its rightful sense of balance uh, with in that Wakahorua vision. Um, and the vision of where we could be is really about realizing the vision of Tatiriti as of here in 2040, uh, this is also from Matsi K. Mai. Um, what would it look like to bring these into rightful relationship with one another, where there really is an equality between peoples and not just an equality between the individuals, but an equality between peoples. So there's that restored balance uh, uh, for mutual benefit and peace. Um, in, the con in that context of the overextension, the reaching beyond what was promised uh, 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 into Tiriti or Waitangi, and through that weight of numbers over time, we see how numbers in a democratic, claiming to be democratic system have very much been used in that dangerous way to silence and suppress rather than to uh, give voice, especially to those who even gave us the right to have a democracy here at all. In, uh, in the context of Kawanatanga, our democracy is unique because it was granted, it's a legitimacy, it comes from Te Tiriti o Waitangi, given that right. Um, so first of all, the parliament began. Um, it, um, most Maori, only I think 100 in the entire nation could actually vote because it was linked to individual ownership. Again, Paki ideas about who should vote. No, uh, only 100 Maori were able to, uh, lim unable to even participate. Um, when that was individuated over time and more Maori would be able to vote, there was concern from Pakia that that meant there would be more Maori voice in Parliament. And one of the ways that was very deliberately conceived to limit that voice was the Maori seats. In 1867, uh, to try to restrict the ability of having greater representation in Parliament, that was limited to four seats as a way to prevent... Um, the proportionate representation, which would have been closer to, I think, uh, 14 to 16, somewhere like that, they would have had that number of seats if it was just been uh, voting as, as other seats were, were filled by uh, proportionate representation. Uh, the Maori role in two independent studies of the last elections, speaking much more recently, we saw a real disproportionate resourcing uh, knowledge of staff um, and even understanding of the Maori role. And so people, many people were turned away uh, from being able to vote, to exercise their right to vote if they were Maori and wanted to vote on the role in the last two elections. Many people were lining up for hours and hours and often drifting off as a result. Many people, because they were misguided, mis told uh, mistakenly how to fill it out, uh, had their votes disqualified. Uh, some were even told the Maori role didn't even exist. There was only the general role. And so you had this uh, real difference in the way that people could exercise their rights to vote, um, even now, even very recently with our current elections. And most recently, um, we've seen this turn and may turn again. We have in some cases, particular seats reserved because we know that even though they would be outvoted, it's still precious. Like we know we need to have those voices at the table, those minority voices. One of them is say rural, rural seats. You say, yes, no matter what, we need to be able to hear from people from the rural regions. We need to ensure that voice. Um, Maori wards are the same, except they're the only special reserved seat that has the provision that can have weapons mobilized against, or numbers mobilized against it as a weapon. In this case, if even 5% of a local population, again, a uh, Pakia dominant population, if even 5% sign their names to say, I object to this one assured seat that allows for those who hold authority in this region to have a voice at the table, then that catalyzes a petition, or sorry, a referendum, which, which is again in a Pakia dominant community, again, without any assurance about understanding how this is working, why this is just, why this is democratic, um, the, why it is statuity honoring uh, can actually overturn it, unlike any other special seat. So we have a, a contradiction in how we treat these seats. Again, numbers being mobilized in this case to silence and suppress and exclude those who actually hold political authority, those who gave us our democracy today. All right, so in this context, yes, numbers. 
numbers are a problem insofar as they are a blunt instrument um, um, uh, and um, in themselves will never fully realize, in fact, might work at cross purposes with democratic aims of making sure people get to the table. Well, what about deliberation? Um, one of the great privileges of my life is working with the Porirua project. Simon, you'll have to tell me because I forgot to start my timer, so I'm looking at the time. I went, uh, you'll have to give me a, a cue at some point. Um, one of my great privileges is working with the Porirua project, and one of those conversations was, was with a number of Pacifica leaders and what, uh, what, about this d design and process of a citizens' assembly. And he said, one of the Pacific leaders in this conversation said, when I hear the word democracy, it leaves me cold. But when I hear deliberation, I get excited. Like there's something about it I find really familiar. It sounds like Pacifica ways of making decisions are actually catching fire everywhere else. So there's something really resonant. Um, it's interesting to hear that difference of how that lands. Deliberation seems to hold a promise. It seems to have a lot more common ground. But there are some real risks in deliberation that potentially reinforce the dominance of one group over others against democratic commitments. So the first is most deliberative processes, when they're mini publics, they work through demographic representation. Ergo, if you have a population whose dominance has been because <laughs> of democratic dominance, uh, demographic dominance, you're going to actually have uh, the same dynamics brought into the room of who's, who is overrepresented and who's underrepresented in that space. Uh, you'll also often in deliberation, there it's, we're not very good at thinking structurally or looking at broader structural um, conditions that affect who can even get into the room or even in that room, who ends up speaking, who ends up being heard. Iris Young calls these external exclusions and internal exclusions. So there are reasons why, you know, for scarcity of resources, a very well-deserved distrust maybe in uh, Western Pakia run systems, uh, not being able to see yourself reflected in it, same reason why people don't vote, really, might mean that people don't get to the table or want to come to the table. But also in the room, who um, who gets listened to, who takes up more time, whose voice um, is uh, heard as more of a knower just by virtue of speaking in a certain way or carrying a certain kind of credentials into the room that are valued. Um, having a certain confidence even affects who ends up speaking more and certainly who ends up listening, what uh, Tanya Dreyer calls economies of attention, right? Those are really unequal of who gets heard. Uh, so we, we don't necessarily design for that very well. We don't necessarily talk about that in deliberation very well. It's becoming more of an area where people are looking. Um, Anna Drake uh, and others are um, trying to draw attention to those broader conditions, which is great, but it's an area that we need work. Um, Others are starting to also talk about how deliberation is often, although there are resonances with other ways of decision making, including here with Tanya Safenua and Pacifica Nations, you do have Western ways of doing that that get reinforced and presumed to just be the way deliberation runs. So there's cultural, really specifically cultural dimensions to deliberation that aren't even necessarily um, acknowledged as culture or felt as culture and just are like, well, that's the way you make an argument or that's the way we, we hear each other and give good reasons, right? So becoming more aware of that will certainly help our ability to um, notice our own cultural edge and hopefully um, even the very partiality of that, you know, how there are many ways of giving account, of giving good reasons, of hearing each other, considering the differences between us. Uh, deliberation has some real particularities. Uh, Seung Jai Min here was uh, identifying a few Deliberation is the child of the Enlightenment and modernization uh, in the West, which valued problem solving, reasoning, strong individualism. The rest of the world followed different modernization paths, and thus Western specific history and its deliberation legacy cannot be easily applied to them. And so it does have cultural differences. Uh, individualism is one. Uh, that's partly why we turn to demographic representation too, and we can talk about that. But there's a really strong bent of almost like we have to convince people to put aside their individual self-interest and come together, that we come into the room as avatars for broader society, but act as individuals in the room. Um, the way we argue or give reasons, our codes for agreement or dissent are very particular, and we don't always notice that. Uh, and so we can miss what's happening in the room, actually, and other certain groups can be missed because we're missing them. Who counts as an expert is another one, of course. Nadine Anhura's beautiful piece, Who Gets to Be an Ordinary New Zealander, identifies some of these trends as well. Some of the ways that our ways of deliberating can itself reinforce one group's ways 
uh, that in turn makes it easier for one group to predominate, one group's way of making sense or reasons uh, to, to predominate in, in a deliberative forum. Um, a neglect of pre-existing and ongoing non-Western forms of deliberation. We are not very good at studying this. There is not a good scholarship on this to date. Uh, sort of an epistemic humility that we need to, to be curious about many other ways of collective decision making through considering reasons and how differently they achieve that with great rigor. I think uh, that's something we haven't achieved very well to date. Um, for me, one thing that's been interesting in watching the Porirua Assembly unfold is watching even, I guess through that experience has really highlighted my own cultural edges in a few key ways. And I'm really grateful for that. One of them is noticing that even the, the notion of who has the right to speak and why is actually really specifically cultural and historical. It's a real tradition that gives us a sense of how we come into the room, why we can speak. It's tied to individualism, my culture. So I, I go in and I think, well, I have a thought to add. I'm a voice, I'm an individual among many. Uh, what it means to be representative, that you can actually be representative, not in demographic terms, but maybe you can't just be an individual. Maybe you always bring your relationships, your responsibilities, you know, all the ways you were brought up to be a leader. Maybe that comes into the room and cannot be disentangled. Um, those are very particular habits we've got in Western deliberation to, to think as individuals in those particular fundamental ways that affects actually who speaks in a space, um, who speaks more in a space. So if, if a bunch of Pakia in a space come in with an individual sense of a right to speak, like, yes, of course, we're all speaking, we will tend to predominate our voices. We will speak more, as well as a sense of confidence, as well as a sense of trust, entitlement, you know, all these things that actually do affect who ends up even being the voices in a room, let alone us missing so many codes uh, uh, um, as to why others aren't speaking or uh, what we're missing in the subtleties of the codes uh, through just using our own. Last thing I want to draw our attention to is um, one, a further dimension of settler colonialism, which is called, Mark Rifkin has the a phrase, settler common sense. Um, and when we're talking about collective spaces where we come together and we bring our reasons and reason should trump power, right? Reason should win the day. The best reasons win. And we will all find a language that we can hear each other's reasons and find out what's in the middle between us. Like that's the beauty of deliberation. In a settler colonial context, it's not just numbers that predominate, but because of those numbers and that settler dreaming that all embodying the beliefs that we carry with us and those become the reality we share. Uh, part of what we carry is often an amnesia about what's come before us uh, and how we got here. And so we naturalize our own position and everything feels like it's in its rightful place. It is just the way we've done things, right? That's what national identity is, is our identity, is our culture. Um, my, my way of giving reasons, my culture, my language, my institutions, uh, my protocols, my laws, all of it is just the way we do things here. And I often, Pakia, as a people, and this is a structural uh, collective issue, this isn't a personal failing, structurally, historically, because of becoming a dominant group in a place and because of uh, embedding that in the world around us so it's the very fabric of the society we're in we lose uh, a sense of how we got here and it leads to a sense of collective amnesia and part of that is also we don't learn our own history in schools you know we're we're really limited here you can see Vincent O'Malley did a poll of like who actually learned about New Zealand history in schools a recent poll showed from the Human Rights Commission who's actually read the treaty you know, uh, uh, another poll found that half of New, Zealand's, uh, New Zealanders don't even understand the treaty principles. Like if we need people to be informed, to do deliberation well, then our forgetting, our not knowing our history, our not knowing our context, our living ahistorically, as Stephen Turner says, living without history, that is a problem because we don't feel the broader context. We're uninformed citizens, which is key to making good decisions together, right? So. Um, this is a problem that collective amnesia leads to an uninformed demos. And that's what um, Mark Rifkin calls settler common sense. One of the biggest aspects of this where we, our ways and our stories, our knowledge, our language, our laws become the ways and then naturalize where we forget how we got here and it's always been that way. One of the biggest dreamings or myths, the settler dreaming as Steve, Stephen Turner would say, one of the biggest myths of this or signs of our settler common sense, Eva Mackey says, is when we act like 
Indigenous people have ceded sovereignty, even though we know they haven't. Moana Jackson and Margaret Mutu, <laughs> besides the text of Titiriti, besides the context, Margaret Mutu and Moana Jackson say, it's like an intellectual and practical absurdity. It's an absurdity for a supermajority to have given over everything, everything to a distant power when their nearest representatives were really disruptive and lawless up in Russell and you know, like this, uh, this wild imagining that this was even possible, right? And But we've acted this way and more and more people inherited this idea that it is this way, it has been this way, forgetting, losing sight of all the things that lie outside that dreaming. And then we act as if it's real. So that's the settler common sense that's quite dangerous if enough of us hold that myth to be true and then act accordingly. Um, here's some examples of, you know, settle, that settler common sense at work, you know, uh, refusing to allow Karakia into the council, which draws such beautiful attention. Same with the example of not being able to wear, you know, having to wear a tie in the parliament, which was another uh, a fight uh, a couple of years ago. Both of those are great examples of highlighting how deeply cultural those spaces are that sometimes we just pretend aren't even cultural at all. You know, really particular protocols and, and traditions, uh, really particular one person, one group's ways have come to predominate, but they come to stand for common sense. So that's the last, that's the last of the big challenges in terms of deliberation. Sorry, I wanted to I give you a sample of all the ways that settler common sense, the, this majority over time that has come to believe, held fast to certain myths about dominance, uh, just dominance, um, coming from a sense of, I don't know, uh, inevitability or the stories of supremacy, that there's something about, of course we would become of course they would cede over all sovereignty and then telling our children that in schools. I mean, it's just, I come from Canada, it's the same story there. So we've been, we've inherited that idea and we, that's the world we grew up in. And uh, when that feels normal, it feels like a common sense. Uh, and in the name of that, this majority working in this way, we violated our Tatiti commitments. Here's only a tiny sample. Many of them really demonstrating a sense of supremacy, superiority, um, the presumption to civilize others, the presumption to take land at um, not even at market value and force sales, uh, turning people into rebels who are just defending their own land and then confiscating that land and so on. Um, uneven distribution of land uh, for soldiers coming back from war, you know, um, not uh, refusing to give Maori the same rights as Pakia in terms of old age pensions or uh, low interest loans for land purchase or unemployment benefits and so on. Suppressing uh, the right of Maori to practice their med medicinal knowledge uh, that led to many deaths with the uh, suppression of Tahunga Act. Many, many examples of this uh, settler common sense working through the law, working through democratic, democratic processes that in fact is actually very undemocratic and very unjust. So settler common sense, um, all of this is adding up to a, a lot of challenges for us. Um, if we care about democratic norms, and we absolutely do, and if we care about Te Tiri Te Waitangi, not just because it gives us our the legitimacy of our democracy, but because it gives us all a way to come together and be finally restore balance and restore honor for everyone and uh, allow flourishing for everyone, finally, finally. Um, there's some questions that I wanted to give you, maybe the things that I'm thinking about are things that have been watchwords for me. Um, probably one of the best things to say is what I, in this context working is, it's like, it's always, it's actually a bit like deliberation, isn't it? Where you're, or democracy in general, where you're looking for a better question. Like it's never resolved, you never arrive, you never know the answer, you continually ask, better, hopefully better questions together as we go. So I wanted to give you a couple of my questions. One of them is most fundamentally, and most things I would say I'm learning, or I feel like our people, my people are called to learn more about, um, have to do with, or can be put into the context of this question. Melinda Weber, who's a professor of education at the University of Auckland, um, one of the best charges she put uh, I've heard anyone put to uh, Pakia researchers, she said, oh, you Pakia researchers, the number one mistake you make is to mistake Maori for content instead of context. And I think that's true for most Pakia, especially practitioners, democratic scholars, democratic practitioners. Continually, we mistake Maori for the content that we put inside our context, our question, our practice, instead of actually the context for all of it. All of deliberation in this country sits in the context of Tino Rangitira Tanga and ongoing colonization. That's the context.
for our questions, our practice. Um, that's the context I think we're called to attend to, to be come in rightful relationship in this work uh, as Democrats, as deliberative scholars. So there's a few points I've got. I feel like I must be out of time, Simon. You're being too gentle with no, me. I'm out of time. I'm, I, I don't like to cut people off. Especially oh, when I'm sorry to put you in that spot. I should have pressed that button. Um, we can talk more about these as we go, but um, of course, learning that history and context uh, in which we live, uh, what is the story of the land that we all live on? What are the stories of our own family, our stories of migration? How can we recover that collective forgetting um, and also understand that context um, so that it can come into the room? Um, how can we honor Tino Ranga Tiratanga in a material, real way? Uh, so how is power being distributed through what we're doing um, with Mana Whenua on whose rohe we live, wherever we are? Um, what, how can we build capacity, especially with Pakia, about uh, non-Western ways of making collective decisions? Like what are the codes and protocols that might be in the room that we're completely unaware of and therefore excluding others in the space? Um, what are the other ways of doing deliberation that we might not yet know? Um, how can we design in ways, and this is a massive one, and no deliberative folks who've even looked at structural contexts have been able to figure this out yet, but there are things we can do when we think about external ex exclusion, internal exclusion. How can we design with that in mind, the idea that we're never just individuals, we're always within uh, various complex structures that mean we're coming in on very unequally. You know, even whose reasons re resonate in that space quickly, you know, in that who needs to fight tooth and nail just to be, at all make any sense, let alone persuade in a deliberative sense, say. So how, uh, who feels confident enough to speak and what's the language they're using they're speaking in the kinds of, um, that are coded for being a reasonable or an authoritative voice? You know, how can we be more aware of that and design to mitigate that? Um, one of the other things that comes up for me though that I think is a really good, and this is what I mean about being oriented, it's not about the content, like figuring out, oh, how Maori work or something. It's actually more about our relationships and it's more about how we are oriented and guided. And that's why I really love Melinda Weber's provocation, context, not content. Feel the broader context for, for all of the questions. The last I'll touch on there. So I, I don't think uh, there's a beautiful document that kind of talks about Pakia culture, some of these habits that get in the way. Perfectionism is one. Purism is another, there's a whole bunch of them. Needing to know, like that's a real habit <laughs> culturally for my people and definitely my tradition of being an academic, it's exacerbated. So needing to be the one who knows and that's what allows me to speak, actually letting go of thinking I have the answers or I even understand. Um, maybe we're not necessarily gonna be the ones to lead, you know, like what is it to seed control as a way to come and to find out, find out what the relationship could be. So not uh, not needing to sort of almost future proof or even for, have knowing as a way to control. Because I think sometimes we won't act until we feel we are sure we'll be safe through knowing. And I think it's really messy and opaque, this work. And I think those the orientation is more important. I think the relationships are more important than knowing. Um, and that has affected how I ask questions. I just want to give that to you and how we pursue our projects. So that sense of our... Often these deliberative questions can look, think about settler colonialism as something or, or Maori ways of decision making or whatever it might be or challenges as something to put inside the context of deliberation. And that I've had to unpick that in my tradition, my way of thinking, like my questions even often set the context for my curiosity, my inquiry. Um, and I was really called up on this early days of living in Aotearoa of how my way of asking questions and do, working even at an honest curiosity, we're actually getting in the way of learning and of having rightful relationships. And I think that sense of context, not content, I just really hope that that feels like a bit of a thing to come back to um, that, that might affect how we ask our questions. The last thing I'll say about how we ask our questions that I've been really tempered by, and I think a really important way, I have a piece I can share with you. When I, um, um, one of the ways that I can not sense where I am is by forgetting how far I am from the heartbreak that is alive and ongoing and life and death for those who are Tangata Whenua and who are especially under attack, ongoing for generations in this place, in their own land. In fact, made a minority in their own land. Uh, for us to, you know, I just can't, um, Emilani Case, I'll share this with you as the last watchword of the evening. Emilani Case, who's a Pacifica um, 
uh, a scholar, poet, activist. She came to our uh, class of mine and she got everyone to introduce themselves based on the relationship to the Fenua. And she goes, oh, that's really good to know. She's from Hawaii. And she said, that's really good to know where you are in relation to the Fenua because when you're, um, when, you're, when you're Indigenous, your heart breaks all the time. And when you tell us where you are in relation to the Fenua, you tell us where you are in relation to the heartbreak. And I think something that I've noticed and I'm tempered by is I'm very far from the heartbreak. I'm very far. And I often forget. And I act in a way that shows I am oblivious to the heartbreak and I, how far I am from it. So I feel that's a key for me has been a way to mitigate the harm that we can inadvertently produce in this kind of context is remembering where we are in relation to the heartbreak. And yeah, the last thing, I, my time has gone off after I forgot, Simon, so I'm definitely over. Yeah, um, right. Heather came and D Dominic o O'Sullivan and a number of others have been working on this beautiful critical TDT analysis that can be applied to any organization or any project. And I really invite you to look it up. It's fabulous work. But the last step on a, how to analyze how an organization or project is doing with TDT honoring is the Indigenous last word. And I just want to give that to you as a sense of, uh, we know we have blank spots. We know there's lots of things we're missing by the nature of settler common sense, forgetting our history, right? There's a lot we're missing. Our dominance of our cultural codes that don't even feel cultural, we're really missing a lot. Um, uh, our ways have become normalized. It means we're excluding without even knowing. So how can we embed, how will we embed ongoing reflection and accountability in how we're working, a, a learning culture as a part of this, so that we can keep um, inviting uh, more information that we might be missing about um, how we're going. Thanks for having me. That's all I have for tonight, Simon.